I worked on the door uh, for 18 years in the Castle City Centre. I also worked at the uh, Ministry of Sound in London and I worked in Ibiza as well. But you'll find out soon enough, one way or another. Not our problem. Okay. Would say like electric or manual. What did you use the last time? Uh, petrol chainsaw. Get dressed. Now. We're short staffed. Tommy brought her in. Ah, you even know his name. Yeah, now I come to think of it. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Steve, how are you, mate? I'm not bad. It's sweltering in the heat. It's like uh, being in the on manoeuvres in the jungle, I would say, Chris. I know, mate. I know. Um, mate, in amongst your uh, varied career and your multi- multi-talents, can we say, actor, writer, uh, f- football and crime specialist, Hopefully not. We don't put them at the no. same time. <laughs> or we Football will. agents, maybe. <laughs> yes. You're, uh, mate, you're a fascinating guy. Um, um, I'm actually in my first film role this year, so perhaps we'll come on and talk about that. But yeah, but you were in the, you were in the TA. Yeah, I was. Um, I was like probably a lot of lads in Newcastle and in the northeast a little bit uh, unruly as a kid um you know once i left school uh i got into uh sunday league football and uh drinking and nights out with the lads uh, we had the infamous big market up here which uh i'm sure a lot of your viewers have probably visited when they've been up into the northeast and um used to be bouncing on a thursday friday saturday and sunday night and um yeah, for me, I just basically got involved in, you know, I wouldn't say with the wrong crowd. I just I just did what did what lads did up here. And I, I started to go off down the, the wrong path, really. Um, you know, I was, you know, I, I wasn't I wasn't a particularly bad individual. I wasn't I wasn't getting involved in crime, but I was I was getting involved with the wrong types of football, um, you know, going on away trips and stuff like that. And um, yeah, me and my dad clashed over the, you know, over this. You know, quite a lot. Um, I was still living at home at the time as well, so you know, going in at all hours and um, you know, bringing the police to the door and and that kind of thing. It wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't me really, but it was you know, part of growing up. Um, and I decided to to, to self discipline myself, and 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 the way that I thought would be best would be to try and you know find something that I could do that would give us that discipline. I always rebelled against discipline when I was at school. I wasn't the greatest a scholar. I always wanted to be an actor. That was always the dream, and um, I just felt you didn't have to listen to those those in you know in, in a higher role. So I enlisted for the um, the TA. Um, I'd, I'd often thought about doing it. I was always very fit, as I say. Played football, you know, played football four or five times a week. Played Saturday, uh, Saturday mornings, Sunday afternoons. And then Sunday mornings, and um, I was playing five aside during the week as well as training. So fitness wasn't wasn't an issue. And I started googling up where I could go to, and um, I found the Royal Engineers, which was based um, at like an Army Reserve Centre in in Newcastle. Um, it was a Field Squadron seventy one Engineer Regiment, and. Uh, I'd just give them a ring, ask them what, what the situation was with regards to, to potentially enlisting and coming along. The, the point of this in the direction of the website, went onto the website and, um, you know, then, you know, basically went along for a, an, an interview and a, and a chat with the, the people there. And um, it didn't take long to get enlisted. I, you know, I was, I was clearly somebody who was enthusiastic. Um, you know, they weren't particularly interested in the reason I wanted to enlist, but they were quite happy to take me on board and, the meetings in those days were on Thursday nights, basically, you know, going along and, and you know, doing drill training and, um, you know, just learning about the, you know, the, the army per se and, and, and what you had to do. And then subsequently from there, it was all about, you know, getting to know the people, getting to know the, um, you know, getting to know the, you know, the, 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 the different things that I need to do and, and going on weekends away, which is, it, it, it had the desired effect, Chris. It, it definitely made me, you know, I was disciplined because I was turning up. I was going there. I was, 
I was I was attending every Thursday and doing what I was supposed to do. Um, but then obviously, you know, going on to these, you know, trips away, uh, weekend trips, um, and and you know, learning how to be, you know, a, a reserve soldier. And I, I say a reserve because obviously that's what it was. It was it was TA. It was and and I got the discipline I needed by being in there. But again, at the age of 21, which is what I was at the time, I I didn't enjoy the discipline. I didn't like being shouted at. I, you know, I didn't like the, you know, the, the fact that they, they tended to pick out, you know, people, including myself, um, for, you know, for ridicule or for, you know, for, you know, trying to try them. Subsequently, now as a 50-year-old man, looking back, I know what they were trying to do. I've watched many programmes on it, but the cajole you, they try and find a weakness, they try and find your breaking point. Um, and, and for me, as a 21-year-old, I still wasn't mature enough to, to accept you know, that was what they were doing. That's why they were doing it. I didn't struggle on the fitness side of things, far from it, but they, they really pushed you. And as I found, you know, on the on the trips away, going to places like um, Catterick and, um, you know, the, the, you know the, the, the weekend camps that we went on, um, you know, we were doing 15, 16 hour days, you know, we would... It, it, a lot of it was psychological as well. I would, I would, you know, and I'm probably, probably sounds a bit weak compared to the people who, who, who you usually have on your show. But for somebody who's a, you know, an ordinary bloke from Civvy Street and, you know, essentially is, is not used to this. Um, you know, they'll get you out and do your three miler on the morning. You would do all your, your your stuff during the day, your battle training, your you know your your class work, where you'd possibly be you know talking about uh, different you know different um, parts of, of military training. You'd be doing your weapon stripping and stuff like that, and uh, you know all of these different things that we were taught. But then you go out at dinner time on your three another three miler the same three miler and obviously you're getting timed you know make, making sure that you're hitting the correct you know the correct time you've got a set period to come through um and then at the end of this long 16 hour day when you just want to hit the sack and go to bed they're getting you back out again to do that same three miler and i've got to be honest that that really did it that got got to me because you know i was shattered i was knackered i was tired and i thought i was fit um but it was that psychological thing of doing that same run, knowing when the incline is, knowing when you know, knowing when you when you can get grab your breather, um, and it was it was it was it was bloody hard. Uh, and you know, for me, uh, as I say, I keep saying this word Civvy Street, but for somebody who was off Civvy Street who was trying to discipline himself, um, I you know, from that moment on, I had nothing but respect for anybody who was in the military because I know how tough it was and the obstacle courses. Um, you know, I mean, I've watched programs, you know, about, um, you know, P Company and stuff like that. In fact, I, I loaded that documentary on YouTube many years ago and it had over a million views because people loved it. And, uh, you know, clearly people who'd been in P Company wanting us, you know, wanting to relive the torture they went through. It was nothing like that, of course, in the TA, but just that, that, that reminded me of the, like the obstacle course we had to do. And I remember the very first camp that I went on, um, you know, I wasn't the, I wasn't the most agile on my feet. That balance was balance was okay, but again, you know, when you when you're going through the the long you know drawn out days that you do when you're in any kind of military training, and um, they always seem to pick the worst time to do these kind of things. And I just remember going over this obstacle course, and there was a water crossing where there was a plank from bank to bank. Um, over this big muddy water uh, water crossing, and I was the last person to go over. Um, and essentially lost me, you know, obviously all the wet, all the wetness on the on the on the log that we crossed over, the plank we crossed over, sorry, um, led to me falling in, you know. So I had to do the rest of the obstacle course soaking wet, you know, me boots squelching, blisters coming up on my feet. And uh, yeah, it was a proper that night I remember going to bed, it was picking the blisters off. It was a proper woe is me moment, you know. Um, but I, I enjoy look, I enjoyed it. As bizarre as it sounds, it was I enjoyed it. It gave me a glimpse into it. I wasn't in a, a massive amount of time. I did eight months, um, which yeah, I, a lot of your viewers will probably laugh at the eight months. But, it, you know, it was eight months of my life, which changed me for the better. Um, and I did it for the right reasons. And, you know, subsequently, I saw people go on to do to, to do great things. You know, a, a lot of my friends went on to have, you know, great military careers. You know, a, a lot of my a lot of my mates went into the Marines. Um, some of them went into the Parachute Regiment. 
uh, others went into uh, just the you know the engineer regiment, but full time, and, and you know graduated from being a, an army reservist and going into the army full time. And um, yeah, I, you know I'm, I'm glad I did it because for me in life, Chris, experience is, is is all you know, and at least you know I can talk about I can talk about it. And and what and what did I learn? I mean, I learned a lot about I learned more about myself than what I learned about the army. I didn't I didn't. You know, I didn't go in to learn about the army. I learned. I wanted to learn about Steve Wraith, what makes me tick. And um, I think my dad, in particular, respected the fact that I'd actually gone and done that because he, he, you know, clearly saw a change in me after that. And um, I kept in touch with a couple of the people from the from the Army Reserve Centre after that. You know, and, and and most of them stuck around. Most of them stayed there. Um, and and you know and enjoyed the time there and uh, yeah it's it's something I'm proud to say that I've done and although I never served never you know never went never never went any further than that never went abroad with 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 the the engineers at least I had the experience of doing it and it's it's boarded well I've, I've, I've you know I've been in a couple of films in in you know in, in my ten year career as an actor um, you know which which has involved you know that kind of thing and I can draw on that experience you know if if, if that opportunity comes up again. Yes, mate, we don't judge anyone on this show well. I mean, uh, probably some subscribers do, but I always say to everyone, don't matter where you serve, how long you did, it, everyone's role in the military is in, integral to everybody else's, you know? If you need someone, I don't know, let's say back at base, stuck in blank, you know, that it, 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 it's a role and... um. What 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 I mean what I'm interested in, what year was this, Steve? Well, it was what 29 years ago now. So you know, 30 years ago, you're looking at 1991, 92. Mm. So did, did they give you the SLR back then or did you get the SA80? It was a SLR, mate, yeah. That's mm. what it was. Um look from 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 my point of view, it was it was just all one big learning curve because I went in with no military experience and no no military knowledge, Chris. You know what I mean? I hadn't gone and researched it. It wasn't me sitting at school wanting to be, you know, wanting to be a soldier. That never came into, into mind. And some people would think that's a crazy thing to do, to go into the, you know, to go into any type of military organisation just because you need to, you know, get yourself back on track and sort your discipline out. But I just thought it was the, the only way, you know. I had no... You know, no desire to, to 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 be a you know like a police officer or, or go into the fire brigade or maybe the you know be a a prison officer. You know, thinking of other things where you you have you know uniform and you have maybe a, a degree of discipline and you have to be fit. It was just that felt like the right thing to do at the time, and because it was the army reserves, you know that was that was it. Um, you know, stripping a weapon and putting a weapon back together was was something which um, I never thought I would ever you know you know do in me in my entire lifetime. And um, you know, to, to go and do that kind of to go and do that kind of thing was was bar. I think I got a realization that you know what what you know what a soldier is trained to do. You know, and it was only that small glimpse of of, of what it's all about that, that makes you realize you know how life changing it can be for somebody who actually goes on to serve. Um, you know, for, for Queen and Country. And that's why I have the utmost admiration, you know, it's why I've gone on to do, you know, maybe fundraising for, you know, for, for various, you know, for various military organisations, those to help people who, you know, come back home you know, with PTSD. It was the first film I did was a, a film about a woman coming back from Afghanistan with PTSD. And, um, you know, it's, it's just an awareness, as I say, it gives you that, you know, when, when you, you know, when you, and it's nice of you to say that whenever you serve that small amount of time, um, you know, that you don't judge anybody. Uh, it, in that period of time, there was a lot of judgment. Um, for instance, you know, a couple of lads who I knew who were serving in the paratroopers at, at the time, when I told them what I was going to do, they were going, well, that's just plain at us. You know what I mean? And it, there was that, there was that like, you know, uh, you know, that narrative coming from, you know, even your mates that, you know, you're just playing, just playing soldiers, you guys, you know, but in reality, as time progressed, I guess, you know, as, as government cuts hit in, it became more important to have, you know, to have the army reserves because, you know, they could be called up. Uh, certainly certain quarters could be called up at any time if, if there was conflict on the horizon, you know, and um, I think that was one thing that really upset me, mom at the time. 
um, you know, that that I would consider doing that. She, you know, she didn't want me to do it really. She she said, You do realize that you could, you know, if you stick at this and do this, you could be taken away and you know, you could have to go and fight for your queen and couldn't you're ready for that. Um, so it was something that she didn't like, you know, but my dad was my dad was quite, you know, my dad was quite happy for me to be involved. And it was funny because they, they were complete, complete opposites with some of the other things that I did in my life. But you know, that's 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 your parents. They're there to guide you, they're there to give you. You know, they're there to give you advice um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's up to you whether you take it. You know, we, we all have our own minds and we all have our own ways of, um, you know, of of dealing with things, you know. Yeah, mate, it's all the rich tapestry of life, isn't it? All these experiences. Your parents try and tell you, but you, I've always found you just end up doing what you want to do anyway, don't you? And then you look back and go, oh, thanks, mum and dad, I should have... <laughs> I should have listened to you. Getting back to the SLR just just briefly, and, and just for me personally, I was never the I was never the greatest scholar, and I've just explained that to you at the start of the podcast about me schooling, and you know I'd, I'd always wanted to be an actor, and I wasn't thinking about that, but you know from my from my perspective, you know it was I did take a lot of instruction and I had to get an instructor and I was always one to ask a question if I didn't know and that of course as you can imagine didn't go down well with you know depending on who you were dealing with at the time you know if you were dealing with a sergeant or or whoever you know you you, you know it, it, it made you an easy target are you not listening you know are you are you you know are you are you deliberately being this thick um you know and and yeah I I, I took a lot of stick for that I took stick for uh, me haircut I didn't I used to have a bit of hair on top and have my hair shaved around the back and sides. And, um, you know, the, it, my, my haircut became a target, um, you know, uh, for the sergeant on, on duty, you know, and, and each time I went to the, the barracks, he would, he would hammer me for it. You know, we don't do people, we don't like people here with fancy haircuts and stuff like that. I can hear him now, you know what I mean? Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we got on really well. We both had, a, you know, away from the barracks and away from that, we got on really well. We both had a love for boxing and, um, you know, we, we, we enjoyed, you know, I, I was training, I was sparring at the time and, um, you know, I enjoyed, I enjoyed the training aspect of boxing, and um, yeah, we, we we both had a lot. Well, at least we had something in common away from it. We both liked the pint of log, and we both liked talking about boxing. So it wasn't it wasn't all such a nightmare with him. But um, but yeah, as well, I tell you, the other thing I struggled with was was eating because I'm quite a creature of habit. You know what I mean? And and like, I I get up, I have my breakfast in the morning, I have my dinner at twelve o'clock, I have my tea at six o'clock, and that's that's me done kind of thing. And I found that quite difficult in uh, as a youngster as well. You know that. You, you know that massive calorie intake before you went out to have a, a day, and then I never exercised well on on a full stomach, and I really really struggled with that, Chris. Um, you know, especially going when we were going away to camp, food was excellent. You know, the the food in the British Army certainly better than what I was getting at school, and it was um, it was just just the amount that you had to have. And I, I tried both ways. I tried not to have too much, but then of course you end up in that situation where you you're literally starving, which affects your performance. You know what I mean? You're weak, your, your energy levels aren't right. Um, and then other times where you're doing stuff and you just, you literally just want to be sick, you know? So it's finding that, it's finding that balance because everyone's, everyone's body and everyone's metabolism is different. You know what I mean? And um, I, I, again, that was, that was, that was one of the things I did like struggle with quite a bit, but um, with the whole boy's own adventure kind of stuff, which I thought it might be, some of it was, some of it was there, you know, it, it was there, but it was, um, yeah, it was an enjoyable experience looking back on it. it certainly gave us what I wanted out of it. And um, I don't regret not carrying it forward and doing it because otherwise I wouldn't have led the life that I've led. But at the same time, there's always that in the back of your mind, you just wonder, I wonder what, I wonder what would have happened if I had stuck it out, if I had kept in, if I had done it, would I have gone into the full you know, would I have gone into the full, you know, the, the you know, the full British Army? I, you know, I don't know. Um, is, is the honest is the honest answer. But um, my life wasn't mapped out that way, and I'm a great believer that your your life is already mapped out. You know, um, that you know you go in a you you, you can you can alter the your de- you can alter the roads that you go on, but eventually it all leads back to the road that you set on. That's that's the way that that, that I believe life is. You know, mm. mate, I'm fascinated to ask you about door work. Mm. Um, I've done a bit of it, lim- limited bit of it. I was, um, I was, I'm going to, I'm going to say quote unquote doorman on free clubs in Hong Kong. The reason I say that is, you know, there's two kinds of door work. There's being a diplomat and 
almost like literally the guy that opens the door. Hello, sir. Hello, madam. Have a great, you know, and then there's the physical kind of side from it. I like fell somewhere in, fell somewhere in the, um, in, in the middle. Um, but yeah, I, I have a fascination with it, Steve. Can you, can you, Tell us how how did you get into that, and how come you 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 did it for for a number of years? Eighteen years, I did the doors in, in Newcastle, London, and in Ibiza, um, and that was really after I'd left the the TA. I'd um, you know got back out to drinking with me mates, but I wasn't being a I wasn't being the, the you know the the idiot that I had been previously, I was, you know, I was calming down a bit. I'd grown up a bit. Um, the military training had certainly given us that. And it was going into a bar called Masters, which was at the bottom of the big market, which which basically I came to the attention of the, the head doorman there, Gary. Um, my mates were still continuing in the same vein. They were still fighting. They were getting thrown out the club and, um, you know, causing trouble. People were, you know, people fighting. And, and I kept jumping in the middle but pulling me mates out and pulling me mates away. And um, it was coming up towards Christmas and Gary, the head doorman said, Steve, could I have a word with you? And I went, yeah, yeah. He says, um, how do you fancy working on the door? And I went, what, me? And he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, um, he said, you know, I've, I've watched you the last few weeks and he says, I've noticed that you're not getting involved in trouble. He says, you're trying to sort it out. And he says, we've, we've got a doorman who is, you know, isn't going to be able to work over Christmas. He's broken his arm. Then he says, we've got four shifts over a weekend, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, £25 an hour if you fancy doing it, you know. And um, I thought, wow, £25 an hour, that's that's mind-blowing, that. I was single at the time and I was thinking about the women who got on the bar and, you know, I was thinking this could be an opportunity for me. So so I agreed. Um, of course, I got a lot of stick off the lads. They were going, you couldn't, you know, you couldn't fight your way out of a paper bag and, and all of that kind of stuff, but... You know, I just said, yeah, I'll, I'll do it, you know. And, and I went down on the very first night. It was the following Thursday. I was told to go down for seven o'clock and be shown around the venue. And Gary was there and, you know, I had a black suit on, white shirt, black tie, black shoes. And um, he just said, this is, you know, this is the fire exit. That's the light system. If it's red, it's the front door. If it's green, it's the middle of the bar. If it's amber, it's the back door. He says, that's where you'll be working on the back door. He says, if I send anybody, if there's anybody who needs to jump the queue, I'll send them around the back door. You just need to let them in. And that was it. And it took about 15 minutes. You know, there's the fire escapes. This is the manager. And, and, and that was it. And the manager said, look, lads, it's a bit quiet at the minute. If you want to come back at about eight o'clock, um, he says, you know, I'll pay you from then. So this was before the days of uh, before the days of licensing. It was before the days of going through the books. So it was all cash in hand. And we just went off to the local pub with uh, Gary, who had a, an insatiable appetite for Guinness before he started work, uh, which I found out to me detriment because we got down to the bar, which is only two minutes away from where we worked at 20 past seven. Um, and we went back to, to Masters, which I was working at 20 past eight. We'd had six pints of Guinness each. And I'm not a Guinness drinker. Um, he was, do you, want a, do you want a pint of Guinness? And I just thought, well, I'll just say yes. Do you know what I mean? Because you know, that's what you do. You're trying to impress. It's your first night. Six pints of Guinness later. That was the worst night I'd ever worked on the door in 18 years. I was backwards and forwards to the toilet. My stomach was going 20 to the dozen because of this bloody Guinness, which I'd never really drank in, you know, drank before. And, um, you know, then I got the hangover at about halfway through my shift because I wasn't, uh, it was just ridiculous. And it taught me a valuable lesson to the point where I never, ever, ever drank on the door. And, and it was common practice back in those days to start, you know, to have a drink on the door. Um, I didn't do it. Um, the second night at Masters was was probably another wake up call because Gary was quite a provocative person on the front door, and you know we in those days there was quite a, a quite a team of doormen. We all worked for the same guy, a guy called Paul Lister. Uh, he was an ex boxer, and he basically you know ran most of the bars leading in the big market and leading down to our bar, which was just at the bottom of the big market across the road, and. Essentially, you know, we had each other's backs. There was no police radio in those days, but there was a radio that linked our bars. And there was a, a group of lads were standing outside. The red light went for us to all go to the front door. Uh, there was eight of us working on the night. We're all standing there. And there's a group of about 
nine or ten lads from Gateshead all shouting and bowling and Gary shouting and bowling back and these lads have said they're going to come back the next night and they're going to be tooled up, you know. So anyway, at the end of the shift, Gary says to us, uh, right lads, so you heard what they said, tomorrow night, everyone needs to bring something in. And I'm like, look at bring something in. And uh, he's going, right, so just make sure you bring a tool in, lads. And I'm like, this can't be serious. I, I'm, I, is this like the start of a job where you get sent for tartan paint or sent for a long walk, you know, or off a short pier? But it, it would be deadly serious. So I got there the next night and these guys did turn up and our lads did, they were tooled up. It didn't end up going anywhere because the police actually turned up. They must have had a tip off of somebody, but the police turned up. The lads were all told to move away. There was a kickoff between the lads and the police. The lads got nicked and nothing actually happened, thankfully for us. But it was a bit of a wake-up call for me because I thought, well, look, door works, door works. You, you know, you deal with your mouth and your hands. But clearly not back in the 90s in Newcastle. That wasn't the way. But um, that Christmas period was fantastic. I loved it. I enjoyed it. Um, it there was a lot of bother in that bar. But I knew because I drank there. Um, the, but the back door, working on the back fire exit, was quite good for me because... You know, people did get sound down the back door, but it gave me an opportunity to make a few quid because a lot of them, a lot of them were footballers who played for Newcastle, who I knew anyway, who were my heroes. People like Steve Watson, Lee Clark, Steve Howie, all the youngsters would get in there. Uh, so they'd bung us a fiver as they were coming in the door. So I was making a little bit extra money on top. And it was just, it was great. I, I just loved the kudos. Um, you know, I, I had some some enjoyable nights with some young ladies after after hours and uh it just became a it just became a, a, a great job. But of course, after Christmas, um, you know, shifts uh, cut and it's last man in, first man out, and um that was it. You know, I was no longer no longer needed there, and it was me who had to make way. So I'd started and I, I had a thirst for it and wanted to continue. So it really, it was really then a case of just going around bars or, or ringing up a few of the lads and asking if you could get us, if they could get us any work. And because I'd done such a good job at Masters, I, you know, I got the opportunity to go and work elsewhere. And my next job was a was a head doorman's job, which was fantastic. So early in me in me doorman career, um, was at a place called Scruffy Murphy's uh, and the Filament and Firkin, which was the same brewery, um, but two bars next door to each other. And uh, me and this guy called Paul Tinian got uh, got joint head doorman. He was head doorman at um, the Filament. I was head doorman at uh, at Scruffy's, and you know we just worked as a team. And it was it was a lot different working at Masters. It's funny you mentioned about Dorman saying hello, good evening, and open the door and closing the door. Well, George, my manager there, was very much a pioneer in that in Newcastle. Um, he wanted politeness on the door. He wanted the customer experience to start and end with the doorman. And he, you know, he was a bit of a stickler for that. And if he came, if he came along and and, and you know surprised you one night and you he'd seen you opening the door or not opening the door, then he'd pull you and he'd say, Look, you know. That's not what I pay you for standing looking on your phone or that's not what I pay you for standing just looking out over. You know, I, I pay you to say hello and good evening. And it did, it pained us a little bit at first, but when I saw the reasoning behind it and understood the reasoning behind it, I thought, you know what, the, the guy's got it, the guy's got, you know, the guy's got it right here. And, you know, the, the, the kind of clientele we got in there was was good as well. Obviously, we were in charge of who came in and out, but you found that the good manners from us and then the good manners from inside, you know, just benefited the overall behaviour within the bar. And it was fantastic. It was it was a great, it was it was great to have a head doorman's job. And I, you know, I just enjoyed having that little bit of that little bit of authority at the place, you know. And um, you know, the bar staff were the bar staff were great, the customers were great, the manager was great, but um, you know, everything, everything, you know, everything changes at some point, you know, sometimes the bars. Sometimes the bars change or, or you change. And um, I got the opportunity to go and work at a nightclub in, in Newcastle. And, um, you know, that took us in a different direction. What um, what effect did it, was it the SIA licence? Is Have I got that right, SIA? What yeah, I mean, basically the SIA licence came in, in in the North East. I think it was Middlesbrough where it first came in and, it was a lot to do with crime and gangsters uh, in the northeast. Um, it was a lot to do with the, um, you know, the, the the fact that drugs were starting to increase uh, in the in the region, and there was a belief that doormen were, you know, were were, were taking 
drugs in the clubs or selling drugs in clubs or turning a blind eye for people to come into clubs and sell drugs in there. And, and from my perspective, I was like, you know, uh, you know, really keen to to stay and, and do the job. And um, it was no no hardship to me to go and do a course, which is what you had to do, um, which was at that time taught by the police, the police and the council, um, and then pay a percentage for your badge. And it was something which I think had, um, you know, caught the eye of, of those down in London, because I think it wasn't short, shortly after the North East had happened that um, it it started to, to take off in London. And, and you would have to have different licences for different areas. So if you did your licence with Newcastle City Council, you couldn't go down the road and work in South Shields or Sunderland or Gated. You have to get a licence for each different area. So... That was that was difficult. It was it was a local authority license, um, a bit like a taxi driver's license, if you like. So yeah, I, I got one. Um, but what you found uh, when the SIA came in, which was a few years later, was that the government realised it was an opportunity to make money from license and doorman, and they wanted to do it on a national scale. And when they brought that license in, it was at the detriment to the to the industry as a whole because it meant that there was a lot of Dorman who'd had past issues, um, maybe he's a criminal record. Let's just for argument say that somebody being convicted of, I don't know, stealing lead off a, a church roof, for example, uh, 20 years ago, um, they suddenly found that they weren't allowed to do the doors in Newcastle anymore be- or, or anywhere in the country because they'd had a criminal record. And that was that was ludicrous. It should have been it should have been certain crimes. They, each record should have been taken into consideration. You know, if someone's got a, a record for violence and, you know, A, B, H, G, B, H, then, yeah, fair enough. I, I understand you don't want somebody on the door. Someone's got a conviction for selling drugs or trafficking drugs. And, you know, fair enough. I can understand why you, you don't want them at door. But if someone's someone's got a criminal record for shoplifting some, you know, something out of a shop or, or whatever, 10, 15 years ago, that's ridiculous, you know. And, and we lost a lot of good dormant through that period. But, you know, from my perspective, it was, you know, I, I, I've got a clean record. I didn't have anything to worry about. And I did find the training beneficial to a degree, although... You know, when you know when it came to it, they would take you through basic first aid, they would take you through um the you know the various types of drugs that people could be taking in clubs and what you had to look for. And um, the ludicrous parts of the course were were like self-defense or how to chuck somebody out of a venue because you know the restraints that they, they would try and teach you just don't come into ordinary life, you know what I mean? Grab someone's wrist twist it like that and then try and walk somebody out with your hand up like that. It's just, it was just, lu- it was just ludicrous, Chris, you know, the, in, in, a, in a, in a one-on-one with a big bloke who's had 10 pints, you know what I mean? Who's 10 stone heavier than you. The last thing you're going to be able to do is grab his wrist and ask, you know, guide him out of the club or, you know, get him in. You know, I always found a good chokehold was the best way to get a hold of somebody. You know, you have to do it right. But, you know, I always felt there's, you know, there's less damage, People don't know where the hell they are. And if, as long as you're capable of getting somebody in a chokehold, they don't like it because their automatic response was to put their hands up on their neck. And just guiding them out like that and, you know, walking them out of the club was 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 probably all I ever needed to do. Um, you mentioned about being, a, you know, somebody like yourself, just talking and communicating. That's what I was capable of doing. And I, I would often take pride in the fact that I could calm a problem down with my mouth rather than escalate it. Um, and there was a lot of doormen who just weren't capable of, of doing that. And that's why I found over the 18 years that I was predominantly on the front door because as a, as a, as a person, the way I look, I used to, uh, you know, I still train to this day, but as somebody who trained religiously, um, somebody who was six foot two, you know, I look, you know, I look the part, but at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm also capable of talking to somebody and, um, you know, not talking to somebody as well. If, if you've got a confrontation in front of you and someone's going, nah, 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 and, you, and you're standing there and you're saying nothing and looking, it's actually more intimidating to somebody than you shouting and bawling back. You've lost your cool and you've lost, you've lost, you've lost the argument. So for me, sometimes silence was golden, you know, and, 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 and being a head doorman, you know, you, you knew who to have on the front door with you. You knew who was going to be, you know, beneficial if there was a situation. The last thing you want is somebody who's going to go out and smack somebody in the face. You, you want somebody who's going to be able to calm it down, you know. But, um, but yeah, it was it was it was fascinating. I mean, in in eighteen years, I hit I actually hit two people. 
That's all I hit, hit to. And then both of those were in self-defense. Um, the rest of the time, yeah, I had to drag people out, had to get involved, had some pretty hairy situations. But in all, am I, am I proud of the way that I did the door? Yeah, 100%. And would I do anything differently? No, definitely not. There's nothing that I would change. Um, the, the, you know, the reason that I walked away from the job after 18 years was because I had family. Um, and with doing the door comes a lot of pressures, um, a, lot of, a lot of threats to you and your family, you know, death threats, um, you know, threats of violence. And there comes a lot of stress. I was doing 36, 37 hours a week. Um, sometimes the biggest, the biggest stress comes from managing other doormen and their egos, you know. The, the doorman's ego is a, is, a, is a pretty fraught thing at times because, you know, that, that – the, you know, some of them feel that their experience means that they should be working on the front door with you and not working inside. And that's a big thing to a doorman. Um, they feel as if, well, oh, well, I'm the main man because I'm on the front door. Um, but if you're, if you're the boss and you're sticking somebody inside and you're asking them to rotate like everybody else, they take that as a bit of a slight. So it was just the stress of, of, of sometimes running all those doormen. I mean, the place that I worked at, Tiger Tiger, we had, um, when I started there, I was in charge of another 12 doormen. But, um, the bureaucracy of, of breweries and, and and the owners as well is, is a nightmare because the capacity of the venue was 2,000 capacity. Um, by law, you're supposed to have one doorman per 100, uh, 100 punters in. So, you know, do the maths. We should have had 20 doormen in on a Saturday night. They brought the smoking ban in, which was an absolute nightmare because that suddenly meant that me and the head doorman had to have somebody on the front door with a stamp in people's hands. So that automatically put three on the front door. Um, and then they started cutting the doorman. And we ended up with a situation on a Saturday night when we had 2,000 people plus in the club because they'd always try and squeeze a few more in. We had three people on the front door and, and they cut the doorman down to four inside. So we had four doormen looking after 2,000 people inside a venue. It's absolutely ludicrous. And I'm thinking, if this kicks off, if we do make a mistake, if we do get it wrong, it's the public who's at risk. You know, we've got three people on the door, but even us three running in, seven of us in the club trying to deal with a big whole scale kickoff in the venue and then having to get them down three flights of stairs, which were happy with that venue. It was just it's asking for trouble. It's asking for trouble. But um, that was you know, more or less the reason you know, family, family coming along and then just just things change and make the job more and more impossible. Just made me think I just don't need the stress anymore and I'm, I'm just going to walk away from it, you know. Steve, have you noticed how much less footballers drink these days is is that a thing yeah i mean footballers footballers still go out um you know when i worked on the doors i mean it's it's 10 years now since i hung up my black coat and gloves but the you know the footballers were still going out then i think i think there's a tendency more for them to go out for meals and stuff depends which football club it is of course but you know they still have their annual Christmas do or you know the, the annual end of season do and they'll still go out but um, yeah there was there was a lot of footballers went out in Newcastle and it's because it's 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 in the top five party cities in the world so you know there is a there is an encouragement for everyone to go out and have a good time in the party city but um, yeah I, I found you know ten years ago that they were still going out and I mean I'm a Newcastle fan big Newcastle fan um, and obviously our biggest rivals. Or we're, we're, we're Sunderland. Um, you know, they've obviously been in the lower divisions for the last few seasons, but they've always been our rivals locally. And on a Monday night and a Thursday night, there was big student nights, which is the nights where you tended to find that the young footballers would come in. And on one occasion, the Sunderland team came to the front of the queue and, and tried to get in. Um, and obviously I knew them because they have been at the venue on more than one occasion. There was a guy called Darren Bent who ended up playing for England, Lee Catamull, who was Middlesbrough and Sunderland. And he came to the front of the queue and I went, Steve, any, any chance we can get in? I went, can you just hold it there, lads? I says, because it's a busy night. And I says, you know, I've, you know, I've got these queues to get in first. These people have been queuing a while. Yeah, 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 no problem, no problem. Danny Dickey was there as well, I remember. Kid with the big ponytails. It was about 11 or 12 of these Sunderland players. So two minutes or so had passed and then... In the distance, I can see this kid walking towards us straight down the middle, and it's uh, a footballer from Newcastle. Uh, it's Shola Amiobi and his younger brother, Sammy Amiobi. So they come straight to the queue, and I'm, I'm still dealing with letting the students in. And uh, Shola goes, hi, Steve, uh, everything all right? And I went, yeah, yeah, no problem, go straight through. 
And of course, the Sunderland players see this and they went, Steve, what, what's going on? And I went, sorry, lads, I've got to let the footballers in first. So, <laughs> so that went down well with the Sunderland team, but a few of the, uh, few of the locals who were watching it did laugh out loud and the other doorman did. But, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, some of these footballers just didn't look after themselves. There's one in particular, I'll not name him, but he was a Newcastle player. We got a lot of money for him when we sold him um, a few years back. And I still say that his career would have been a lot better had he not, you know, gone to excess when he went out on nights out. He, you know, used to drink a lot, used to go out and drink, you know, a hell of a lot. And, you know, from from my perspective, it's such a, it's sad to see people who could have been better not, you know, not maintain the discipline when they're not playing football. Um, because, you know, the spoil spoiled it. And you've got you've got some consummate professionals like Peter Beersley, for example, who never drank a drop. You know, he's completely teetotal. His biggest vice was dairy milk chocolate, I think. And, um, you know, it just goes to show he, you know, went on to, you know, to play for so many clubs, you know, represented his country many times um, and is a, is a true legend of the game. So, so yeah, it's, it, you know, you, you see it, um, you know, you see it. And when you see it, you've just got to deal with it. Um, you know, I think the much publicised story of, or stories of Gaza are, are heart-wrenching. I've known, I've known Paul, best part of, uh, 25 years now and it's never nice to see you know the you know the the rise and fall and then rise again of Gaza and um, he's in a good place at the minute but it's just never it's never nice to see him when he's on a on a downer you know when he's when he's when when alcohol ravages him and he's you know he's he's not himself so it's 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 not nice it's not nice at all but yeah you, you see all of that um, you know when you when you're doing the doors, and uh, you know you see the you see the other temptations for the footballers. You see the the young girls, and I was always very particular on the door with with girls coming to the club. Um, I had been as a young man um, victimised by doormen. I, I always looked quite young, um, and the doorman would always stop me and ID me. And if I didn't have any ID, I'd get turned away. I'd get turned away for having a skinhead as well. I'd get turned away for having white socks on. So when I was a doorman, I was always very particular about, you know, women in particular, girls. And I didn't want to be hoodwinked by a girl and, um, you know, letting a 15 year old in, for example. So I, I, I did virtually every single person who came into the club on my side of the door, whichever place I worked at. And I, I stopped a lot of girls getting in. They didn't like it. But, you know, it was that was me doing my job. And, and subsequently in, over the years, Things changed, you know. The breweries, the breweries were were eventually getting fined for letting young kids in. They were sending mystery drinkers in who were, you know, who were underage. And the brewery was the brewery was testing its own managers and bar staff. And you know, it's just just the way of the world. You have to do your job properly when when you know when time pushed on. Mm. Steve, have you ever met Ant and Jack? Yes. Yeah. Luckily. Um, uh, met them a few times. I mean, they're great ambassadors for the North East, Ant and Deck. Um, Ant likes to drink a little bit more than Declan. Um, they both have their moments. Um, I've seen Ant, I've seen uh, Ant on the drink a few times. But yeah, that, look, they're both, they're both great lads. Uh, Deck's just lost his brother, um, Father Dermot uh, Donnelly, which is which is such a sad loss for not just him, but in the family, but for the North East in general. But um, yeah, they're, look, they're great ambassadors. They, you know, they started off as kids, um, in Baker Grove, um, and and became you know became legends. You know they they filled they filled a gap for you know for entertainment on a Saturday night, which had been vacant since the likes of you know the two Ronnies and Morgan and Wise had, had, had disappeared. And I don't I don't want to do them a disservice because they'll never be able to tie the boots of Morgan and Wise or the two Ronnies, but that's their job. You know they 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 are good front men for. Saturday night TV, you know, they get away with this cheeky chappy look and, you know, they present a lot of programs and, you know, they've got, they've got, you know, I would say 20, 20 odd years of experience now, but 20 odd years of awards to go with it. And it tells you that the general public do like them and, and love them, you know, but, uh, but yeah, you know, they're very careful. They don't get, they don't get, you know, get out too much in Newcastle. They'll probably pick and choose the venues that they go to, but Newcastle's such a, cosmopolitan city now compared to what it was 20 odd years ago and it's got so many different um you know places for people to go and and places for people to eat it's you know restaurants cafes 
Um, you know, they are, you know, you know, it, it, it's, it's a much developed city compared to what it was probably when I was growing up. Um, you go down to Newcastle Quayside, it's, it, it's a wonderful place to visit now. Whereas, you know, when I was a kid growing up, it was all wooden staves and, you know, warehouses and, you know, delinquent, but, you know, de- you know, de- just delinquents. It, it, it just wasn't, a, it wasn't a nice place. It was, it was dilapidated. That's the word I was looking for. It was dilapidated. And now it's, um, you know, now it's prospering and the, the whole city is, it's, um, it, it's really good. And, you know, the atmosphere in the, in the city only improves when the football team does well. Um, and of course, the last 14 years, it hasn't. But with a, with a recent takeover at Newcastle, things have uh, you know things have changed with the football team as well, and we're hoping that the uh, you know the, the future is not just bright, but it's black and white. Mm-hmm. Steve, what about the the uh, the boat, the nightclub that was on the boat? <laughs> is it Tuxedo Royale, or am I, am I getting my names confused? No, no. There was the Tuxedo Princess, and there was the Tuxedo. There was a Tuxedo Tuxedo Princess and the Tuxedo Royale. Because there was there wasn't just one boat. There was actually two. Uh, one was moored in uh, underneath the Tyne Bridge, and one was moored in Teesside, um, and then got moved up to Edinburgh, I think, or Glasgow. But um, yeah, I mean, it was it was famous because it, it had a revolving dance floor. Um, so anybody used to stand on the dance floor, you know, you'd spill your paint or. You know, it was uh, it, it was quite unique. I mean, it was it was on the Gateshead side of the time as well. Um, but that was in the, in the late eighties and early nineties. Michael Quadrini's idea of having a floating nightclub was was one which clearly you know grasped the public's imagination on on time side, and it it made the it made the key side flourish. You know, lots of bars opened up down there. I mean, I, I worked as head doorman at a place called Chase on the key side, which was on the other side of the boat. Uh, but then there was other places opened up next to the boat. There was uh, Baja, uh, Baja Beach Club, uh, then Buffalo Joe's opened up. Um, but eventually, the decline on the quayside and the you know the rise of a, you know, a different part of Newcastle, which is the Golden Strip, as they call it, Collingwood Street, along from Centre Station. Um, it just meant that those places got quieter. The boat eventually was shut down because it had asbestos on it. Um, which had been discovered and, um, you know, the boat was taken away, decommissioned and eventually um, cut up for scrap. And the the other clubs didn't last much longer. Baja Beach Club uh, closed and then Buffalo Joe's closed because people stopped going to the quayside. They were going to different parts. And that's what happens. You, you know, you go through waves of different parts of the town working. And one of the, you know, my very first head doorman manager, George, who asked us to open the door and close the door, uh, which I mentioned earlier, he said it goes in cycles, you know, and this this place will have a bit of a boom and then it'll be that part of the town and that part of the town and how right he was, you know. But yeah, the, the boats, a lot of people have got a lot of happy memories. And on my podcast, um, on my YouTube channel, uh, we, we actually discussed that a couple of weeks ago on the football show. Somebody was asking about the boat and then we ended up with a load of people's different stories. I mean, some people met there. And ended up getting uh, ended up getting married. Some people had had a fight on there. Some everybody remembered the re- uh, revolving dance floor. Um, but yeah, I think there's there's so many stories out there about about that particular venue, and it's one I guess which is iconic and stays in the mind of people who probably visited Newcastle in that period. Mm. Steve, you've starred in two films that I've really enjoyed. Uh, so, Rise of the Foot Soldier Three. And also recently I watched The Crazed Dead Men Walk In and you starred in that one as well. Yeah. What, what came first? The I'm, uh, I'm guessing the fascination with cr- or the interest in crime, should I say? Yeah, I mean, when I, was a, when I was a kid at school, I picked up a copy of a book called Profession of Violence by John Pearson, uh, which was about the Cray Twins. I read it in a couple of days and the English teacher... Um, allowed me to study that book as part of my GCSE uh, coursework towards my final exam. So I passed my English exam uh, with well, got English language B and English literature C, thanks to reading that book and doing such good coursework. Um, so I decided to write to the Crays as a 16 year old. I wrote to Reggie Cray in Gartry and Ronnie Cray in Broadmoor, and I got letters back from both of them. And I pursued it a few months later when I saw an article in a magazine uh, called take a break which my mom had about a young guy called Brad Lane who'd been adopted by Reggie Cray and he was calling himself Brad Cray 
So I wrote to them, they wrote back, and they said, if you're ever down in Doncaster, pop in and see us. And I had friends in, in Scunthorpe, but by this time I was like 17, coming on 18. Uh, this is how long this had developed. And I just went down um, to, to see Brad and his mother, Kim, and they had like a, it's almost like a museum in the, in, in this house of career memorabilia. They had some of Reggie's old suits. They had the wedding photographs. They had Francis, Reggie Cray's wife's engagement ring. And there was just, you know, it, it was just amazing. And on this particular visit to them, the phone rang and it was Reggie Cray. And once Brad and Kim had spoken to them, uh, they said, Reg would like to speak to you. And I, you know, I picked the phone up um, and, and spoke to Reggie Cray for the first time. And I was I was blown away. His final words were, you'll have to come down and, and have a visit, you know. So it was a couple of weeks later, I was put on a visit in order to go and see Reggie Cray in Gartree Prison. And uh, the rest is history. A couple of weeks after that, I was down at Reg's insistence um, to go and see Ronnie and Broadmoor. And at the time I'd left school, um, I was working in the family post office and I was also making T-shirts in my spare time. So I was putting T-shirts together with Peter Beardsley, Chris Waddle, Kevin Keegan on. So in my dialogue with Reggie Cray uh, by letter, I suggested that we did a, a T-shirt with the image from Profession of Violence on the front with Ronnie and Reggie Cray and the words Profession of Violence on a white T-shirt but like this. And they said, yeah, great idea. We'll go 70, 70, 30 with you on it, which... And I was putting all the money up, me and my mate who were doing the T-shirts. Uh, but they would, um, you know, they would get 35% each and me and my mate would get 15% each. But seemed seemed like a good deal to me because, you know, we we're getting something for nothing. And I went into business with a craze as an 18-year-old man um, or an 18-year-old boy, however you want to say it. And, um, yeah, we never looked back. We made a lot of money. Um, my dad at the time was a lecturer at Sunderland University. He was doing spreadsheets and um, he was he was doing, uh, you know, basic, basic computing at the time, but teaching people how to do not only spreadsheets, but, you know, lists of names and addresses and, you know, databases. And um, I suggested to Reg, I said, look, you're getting a lot of, you're getting a lot of fan mail. Why don't we, why don't we start putting together this database for you? You know, he was averaging some weeks, 400 letters a week. And, you know, we said these are all potential customers. So we started putting the T-shirts out into shops. We started in Newcastle. We got into Sunderland, Middlesbrough, Hartlepool, Darlington, York. Uh, and then, you know, the orders were just coming in thick and fast. And, and then with the people who essentially had, um, you know, got the letters to Reg, we were building up that database. So we were making flyers and sending the flyers out to these people and, I wasn't the only person doing this. There was a couple of people. There was a, a woman in Nottingham called Steph King who was doing exactly the same. But I, I became a small cog in this network of the Crazy empire behind bars. And it was a suitable arrangement for me. And, uh, and, I, and I look back now and people say, do you not regret doing that? Well, I go, well, no, because ultimately my life is... Now, my life experiences have, have all developed through, you know, through this particular, you know, this particular experience, this particular story. And, I, you know, I've, I've gone on to set up a couple of businesses myself. And I always say, if you can do business with the Cray Twins, then you can do business with anybody, Chris. Um, and and, and I've, I've definitely been proved right, I think, with that. But, yeah, I mean, to go through to go through that whole, you know, that, that whole experience is something which I'll always be thankful for because, how many people do you know get a chance to pick up the book, read it, um, and then walk into the book, go through it and meet all of those characters that you've read about? And, you know, thanks to my relationship with Charlie Frey, the, the twins' older brother, um, who was on the outside, I got to, to meet a lot of other famous faces. I got to meet, you know, the train robbers, you know, Bruce Reynolds, uh, Tommy Wisby, Buster Edwards. I got to meet um, Freddie Foreman, of course, Brown Bread Fred, who was you know, the, one of the Cray's best friends over, over the years. I got to meet Mad Frankie Fraser, who was part of the Richardson gang. I got to meet the Richardsons, both Eddie and Charlie. I got to meet the Bare Knuckle Boxers, Roy Shaw, uh, Lenny McLean. Um, and the list, you know, the list goes on. And it, it, it subsequently developed through, you know, through no, no planning. It just, it just developed because, you know, I was just myself. I wasn't pretending to be somebody I wasn't. And because 
I guess I was valuable to the twins while they were inside. You know, I was I was somebody who, as I say, was a small cog in a big machine who, you know, rightly or wrongly was making themselves some money, but also making myself some money as well. The whole train robber thing is is a tragedy, wasn't it? I I met Buster once on I think it was um uh, Charing Cross platform, he was selling flowers. And he committed suicide. And when when you look back at the enormity of what they pulled off, and then you looked at the reality of what they then had to live with because of what they did, it it it, it wasn't a result that they all hoped for, was it? No, I mean, you know, it's a fascinating crime. I mean, it's a crime against the, you know, a, a, a crime against the Queen, really, in the Royal Mail. Um, but such a such an amazing story. Um, but yeah, they were undone really by the amount of people who were involved in the robbery and the fact that you know that the person who was paid to to set fire to Leather Slade Farm didn't do it. And mm-hmm. you know, planning planning the job and the, the execution of the job couldn't have gone any better for, for, for Bruce Reynolds and the guys, but there is always a weak link in the, you know, in in in, in that kind of organisation, and having too many people involved proved to be it. Had had Bruce decided we're going to keep it a small level, we're going to do the job, and we'll burn the place down ourselves, and that's it. But mm. wasn't meant to be, you know. It was it was their fate, and you know the story ran and ran because. You know, obviously the you know the, the the main players, if you like, went on the run. Um, you know, yeah, yeah, Bruce Reynolds and um, you know, yeah, your Ronnie Big story, which is, is fantasy island, really. You know, I, he, he he did get caught and he did get sentenced and he did get you know arrested and charged and put into Wormwood uh, Wormwood schools, but then pulls off the great escape on top of a on top of a furniture van and he's away. You know, and. Um, lives out the rest of his life or most of his life in, in Rio de Janeiro. He, you know, he was cocking a, cocking a snoop at the law up until he had to return home for health reasons. And it, yeah, it's a fascinating story, but it's a sad story. As you say, the Buster Edwards story is, is, is very sad. And, um, you know, that it's that old adage, isn't it? You know, crime doesn't really pay. And, you know, a lot of these former villains who I've met will always tell you the same thing, you know, don't follow in my footsteps. Don't, don't get involved, you know, and it's that that old adage again. If you can't do the time, then don't do the crime. And you'll, you'll, a lot of these former villains, although they can, you know, they wrote books, they did documentaries. Um, you know, I think a lot of them regret the time that they had in in prison, and also regret the time that they, you know, that they, that they lost with their families. One or two of them, I know, don't regret a single thing, uh, but I think a few of them really did, and I think Buster's probably one of those who did. Mm-hmm. Another crime that public's fascinated with, or certainly a percentage, is the the Rettenden murders. Mm, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. What? Essex boys. Yeah. Why do you think that still holds such fascination? I think it's just because it's been, you know, the subject of not one, not two, not three, not four, but probably five or six films um, and numerous books. And there's a lot of people who won't let the story die. Um, and, and, you know, uh, there's lots of theories, I think, because there's never been a there's never been a conclusion to it. I think that's why it, it, it remains open for speculation. Who did it? Um, you know, people may say that, well, people were arrested, charged and have served sentences. But a lot of people don't believe that was the, the, the real killers. Um, you know, and I just think that it will run and run and run. But it, it's fascinating. Um, obviously, you mentioned earlier, Rise of the Foot Soldier 3 is a film that I was in. Uh, you know, I, I played Steamboat in the third film, thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, it it's become become a, a really successful franchise, you know. Yeah, did you, you acted alongside Sean Ryder in that, did you not? Or am I getting yeah, my she, movies confused? Yeah, Sean Ryder of, of Happy Mondays fame. It was his first and last acting job. Um, I, I mean, I knew Sean from... Uh, Newcastle anyway, I'd done security for him a couple of times when he'd visited Newcastle, but I'd also um, I'd also been a big fan of the Happy Mondays and been to a lot of their gigs, but Sean and I knew each other before we came on set, but on, on the day that he came on, he, he had his script in his hand, 
he didn't know his lines. And anybody who knows Sean personally will tell you that he doesn't even know the words to his own songs uh, with the Happy Mondays. Uh, put it down to a, a bad memory or maybe put it down to a little bit of extracurricular activity uh, when he's off stage. It could be a little bit of both. Um, but but ultimately for, for for Sean he struggled a bit with with the, the lines. Um, but it was it was great fun working with him. I thought he came across brilliantly on screen, and he was just a lot of fun to to work with. But you know when we finished and we did the rap part, he he just said, "Look, Steve, I'm never doing this again. I don't know how you do it." And um, you know that was that was it. That was it. it was the shortest acting career I think in, in living memory. But um, he was great. Yeah, it was me. There was Sean Ryder. Um, obviously Craig Fairbrass, it was great to work with Craig. You know, I had to do two fight scenes with Craig, which 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 was for me was it was a great experience. Um Eddie Weber as well, fantastic to work with Eddie. I mean, you know, he's 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 been in so many of these films over the years. Um, you know, and and you know, he did the business, for example, he'd done other done other shows about the written the murders. But he's such a great professional, and I've, I've subsequently gone on to work with him on the what was dubbed as the new Quadrophenia film to be someone that Ray Burgess directed. And me and him, uh, you know, did a few days together on that as well. So for me, it's great because I, you know, I always wanted to be an actor. Um, but I got, you know, I I just got out of it at a young age. I'd I got ripped off when I was seventeen. Um, I'd, I'd acted from the age of seven until I was uh, seventeen. I got ripped off doing a, a tour in pantomime. We did sixty shows in just short of four weeks. Uh, sometimes we we're doing three shows a day, putting the set up, doing a two-hour show, taking the set down, traveling to the next venue. But for those 60 shows, I only got paid 500 quid. I got promised an equity card and I didn't get it. And I just thought, if that's acting, you can stick it. And I walked away and I went into the family business. And um, it wasn't until I was 30 uh, that I got I got a phone call from a good pal of mine who, who'd gone on to do very well, John Altman, who uh, plays who played Nick Cotton in EastEnders. Mm. Um, he was also in Quadrophenia. And, and Nick... As uh, Nick's character was something which I'd always fancied, you know, I'd love to have played myself. It's that kind of part that I enjoyed playing. But yeah, John was on the phone. I was working on the door in Newcastle. He said, I'm doing a play called Bouncers. He says, is there any chance I can come up in to Newcastle? Because I'm looking for some lodgings when I'm up there. Got to come up anyway. And he says, I'm just wondering if I can come and spend a night on the door with you to, to get a bit of a feel for it. And I went, yeah, yeah, no problem. That's, that's fine by me. So he came up. Um, and he did a night with me. The manager was over the moon. He had a celebrity in his club for a, a, a on a freebie for a night, and um, it did it, you know got him. He got some publicity out of it. But then about six weeks later, you know, he came back up. He did the play. Me, I took me me wife and uh, my mother along to to watch him. And then we had a night out, and he, he, his fellow actor was a Geordie actor called Chris Connell, who me and him had been on the same course back when I was a kid, because I, when I left school, I went on, went on to do a BTEC diploma, but I walked off it after that that bad experience. And he just said, Steve used to be an actor. John went, I know. And then they both started saying you should get back into it. And anyway, cut long story short, Chris Connell had an agent. He suggested that I go and see her. Um, I, went, I went to see this agent in Newcastle and she said, look, why don't you try your hand at being an extra? She says, start off being an extra, get the experience, See if you like it, and then we can we can talk and see how things progress. So I did six years as an extra. Um, I enjoyed it. I did you know Biker Grove probably four or five times. I did uh, Wire in the Blood, um, but I did a few other other little student films which were um, which were good to do. I did Goal in Newcastle, the football related film. I played Bartez in that. Just got a chance to play on St James's Park, which which for me was fantastic. Um, but I, you know, getting to, getting to like five or six years in, I thought I'm going to pursue the acting side of it. So I went back and did the GCSE when I was 35 um, in performing arts at college. And the lecturer who took it was actually a friend of mine from the People's Theatre where I'd gone as a, as a child. So I did that. That was my first bit of drama on stage for 17 years. I played a, a part called Mickey um, in a play called Your Home in the West. A uh, bit of a psychopathic, evil man. And uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Le- learning the lines, I-, I managed to do it. It was no problem. Um, and I said to me, my lecturer, my mate Steve, I said, um, what do you think I should do next? And he said, you should do the degree. 
I said, well, how long is it and how much is it? He said, it's three grand a year and it's, you know, it's three years. So I weighed it up, spoke with the missus, uh, continued to do the doll and got involved in, in, in doing a degree. So I graduated, um, well, when I was 39 and that's when I became a professional actor. So um, the next stage was trying to get a, get some work. I didn't have an agent, so I went to get some work. And it was a film called In Our Name, a low-budget film, which was about uh, a young woman coming back from Afghanistan with her husband. They both served and they both had PTSD. And it was how the relationship broke down between the two of them because of this, you know, because, because of PTSD. And Joanne Froggett, who she's gone on to do uh, Downton Abbey, but she was she'd just done Coronation Street at the time. She was the main star. So I went along, I put me, I put a submitted in, I said, I haven't got an agent, but I got a casting for it. And I got cast as a sergeant major in the film. And I, I got a chance to play alongside Joanne. We didn't, that, that scene actually got cut, but the scene that at the start of the film is me. I'm, I'm basically running the, the you know, the, the squaddies across the, the moors and I'm running her and I'm giving her, uh, giving her a load of grief, shouting and bawling at her. Um, and that's it, you know, that was my first actually movie credit. But I did a lot of help for the director. I got him some extras. I got him some venues. I got him some locations. And at the at the rap party, he said, "Steve, is there anything I can do for you?" I said, "Could you get us an intro to the uh, you know to the the casting director?" I said, I, "I you know I believe she's an agent. She's called Sam Claypool." And he went, "Yeah, yeah." He says, "I can." So he introduced me to her, and the rest is history. She took me on after an interview um, the following year. Um, went down to hers after it was like round about Christmas time. We'd finished the the shoot. I went down in January to a place in Darlington, went for an interview with her, and she says, You're rough around the edges, but I'll I'll take a chance. And um, she she, you know, she took me on her books, and I'm still with Sam. I've got a London agent as well. Um, but yeah, it was just, you know, to, to get that opportunity for somebody to see something in me um was 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 great. And um it's difficult. Anybody you say you're gonna do your first act and part, it's it's a great career, but it's not a career that you can you can make millions at unless you're you're very lucky. Um, my my CV is good. My IMDb, you know, I've, I'm probably up to 22 cast roles now. Mm. Um, a lot of good films. Rise of the Foot Soldier, of course. I did Vera on ITV. Um, I did um, the uh, 55 Degrees North on BBC. I did two series of that. Um, so. I've, I've had some highs and I've had some lows. To Be Someone was a great film to do because I was working with a lot of the cast of Quadrophenia. Uh, got to know, got to work with them, got to know them well. I've just done my first lead role, uh, which comes out in Boxing Day. That could change things again for us. Just done a film called Trafficked, which um, I play the lead villain in it. Um, and then in October, I'm filming another lead role in a film in the Northeast, so, uh, which is based on the Sears family. So, I'm, I'm, you know, at the moment, I seem to be on a bit of a run. But, you know, you can be six months away from doing nothing, you know. So you've got to have other irons in the fire. You've got to be doing other things to to keep paying the bills. Mate, it's just a great achievement. It, it, your IM, is it IMDB? I always get that yeah. messed up. Yeah, so it's very impressive, folks. Go and check it out. Steve's <laughs> had quite quite a few roles now. Um, for my upcoming experience, mate, I, it, for me, it's just a tick off the list, you know. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm honoured that my mate has cast me. Um, and this is what I live my life for, mate. It's just different experiences, you know. Yeah. Um, different experiences. I'm quite... And, and it's that thing, is it? You always wonder, how would it be as an actor? <laughs> so we're going to find out. Just be yourself, Chris. I'm sure you'll be fine. And it, it, it does get a bit addictive. It does get a bit addictive. Once you've done one and you see yourself on screen and you get your, you know, you, 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 you get people going, oh, you were great in that. When's your next one? You, you'll find that you, you may want to do another one, you know. Or you could be, or you could be like uh, Sean Ryder and decide one's enough. <laughs> Steve, it wouldn't be... Uh right to finish without talking about your passion which uh, is Newcastle United um, yes uh, an outstanding team over the it goes back to what 1893 I think the league was 80, started, yeah. was it? 1892 for Newcastle yeah they had two teams Newcastle East End Newcastle West End um, and then they merged together to form Newcastle United how come they produce they produce so many good players over the years. Actually, I mean Newcastle itself. 
It's down to the the boys clubs in the area. Uh, Walls End Boys Club probably takes the, the you know the pride of place in Newcastle, and in Gateshead, it's probably Red Hoof Boys. Um, so you know from Red Hoof Boys, Paul Gascoigne was spawned, and from Walls End Boys, Alan Shearer was spawned. Two of the biggest names in in world football, not just football in the UK. Um, and it's always been the connection with the boys clubs and Newcastle United that's seen you know players come through the ranks. Um, I think over the last fourteen years, with with the ownership that we had under Mike Ashley, things stagnated a lot, and the connection with the community and the football club was was spoiled a little bit by his you know his ownership. The new owners, uh, the Saudi backed um, owners, PIF, um, who are also involved with the Ruben family and Amanda Stavey, Amir Gadusi and PIF, um, they all have a, a better understanding of what is needed at the football club. And for me, I think they understand the, the value of the community and the supporters and have done so much in a short space of time to work with them. Um, success isn't something which we're used to. Uh, Newcastle United's last domestic trophy was 1955 when we, we won the FA Cup with the likes of Jackie Milburn playing. Um, our last European trophy and last trophy full stop was 1969, which was the Fairs Cup, which is now the you know the Europa League. So, you know, we are used to disappointment. Um, there's been plenty of clubs, though, who have had worse times than Newcastle United. I can think of Bury, who went out of existence. You know, there's been many teams who've gone out of existence. But Newcastle fans are just realistic. I think all we want is a, an opportunity for us to have a bit of hope at the start of the season. And we haven't been able to have that under the previous owner. So this new owner is coming in. They've got money to spend. They're giving us a little bit of hope back now. And it's just nice to see that they're willing to work with the people in the community. So, you know, it's it's just, it's all changed, Chris. Um, people are more inclined to buy replica shirts. People are more inclined to buy tickets for games and people are more inclined just to support the team in general. And like I mentioned right at the start of the show, when the team is doing well, the city is more vibrant. The city is doing well. And that's that. it's a big thing. It might sound weird to, to some football fans that, but I think it's just because of the close proximity to the, you know, the, 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 the city centre and the club. Uh, the club is slap bang in the middle of the city centre. And it's surrounded by those pubs and bars and restaurants and coffee shops that I mentioned. And it, it's why it's such a big thing for the community. And Newcastle win the rest of the week is very upbeat for the people of Newcastle. If Newcastle lose, it does affect the mood on that Monday morning when everyone goes to work. So it's very much part of the city's uh, sinew. And, um, you know, it, it, it's the bloodline of the city, the football club. And it it's very much a, a religion uh, to the people up here. So... You know that's why people do get a little bit aerated um, when when the clubs attacked or or the fans are attacked. You know, so it's um, it's something I'm immensely proud of to be involved with. You know, I've been I've worked for the club, but I've commented on the club for many many years, and you know it's it's a club I've supported uh, since 1984. So yeah, it's it's a big part of my life, and I think a lot of us who are up here, if you cut us, would would bleed black and white, not red. You know. Mm-hmm. Steve, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting, mate. Thank you so much for coming on on the show. Thanks, um, mate. Been a pleasure, ple- yeah. pleasure to come on as well, you know. Mate, give my love to Newcastle. Um, you meet lots of Geordies when you're in the, in the forces. It's quite a quite it's quite an experience the first time you meet one. Yeah. You ain't got, you ain't got a fucking clue what they're saying. <laughs> <laughs> I do tend to speak a bit slower when I come on here, but um, yeah, I mean, the connections between the North East and the Army as well. I mean, Nigel, Nigel Ben, probably one of the best boxers, greatest boxers of our time. You know, he was stationed up at uh, over Catterick and whenever I've put him on, I promote up here. I put a lot of boxers on up here. Nigel loves it up here and there's always a lot of his, um, uh, you know, his former uh, squad, squaddy mates are, are, are always at the do. So it's, uh, yeah, the connections are great, mate. But um, if anybody wants to check out my YouTube, it's Steve Wraith, pop on. A lot of it's Newcastle United stuff, but I do do um, military interviews as well. I've had um, I've had Andy McNabb on there. Uh, I've had Peter McAleese on the show, and I've also had uh, Nigel Ely on, uh, which goes goes live in a couple of weeks. But if you just search Steve Wraith on YouTube, you'll be able to find it on there. 
Yeah, Spud's a good mate of mine. He's we we're, we're going to put on a Falklands Memorial show together later in the year. We're going we're going to we're going to do a public Q and A night so the public can come along and you know ask ask these guys questions. Um, yeah, he's always a good chat, Spud. Great. Well, give me a shout about that because if that can come along, I will. It'd be good to see. Uh, come, good to see that and support it. Yes, very kind of you, mate. Very kind of you. So, Steve, massive, massive thank you. Friends at home, I hope you've enjoyed this as much as I have. Um, Steve's uh, got books out on Amazon, so go and check them out. Check out Steve's YouTube channel. And, uh, Steve, we hope to have you back at some point. Take care. Best of luck, Chris, and I hope everybody uh, watching enjoyed it, and best of luck to everybody out there. And, um, yeah, thanks to everybody who served. It's uh, it's a big thing for me and Civvy Street, you know, when you see what's going on, especially in the Ukraine at the moment, you know, um, often think about what's going on out there. And, uh, you know, it's, you know, from from our perspective, we're just proud. You're proud to be British, but you're proud to have the British Army, you know, protecting you. It's a big, big thing for for us in Civvy Street. Thank you, Steve. Stay on the line, mate, so I can thank you properly. To everybody at home, massive love to you all. Please look after yourselves. If you can like and subscribe, that would be really kind of you. Um, We'll see you next time. Thank you.